the manifold great favours we have found by you to us, poor weaklings still extended, whereof your virtues have been only ground and no desert in us to be so friended, binds us some way or other to express, though all are all be else defeated quite, of any means save duteous thankfulness, which is the utmost measure of our might. Then, to the boundless ocean of your worth, this little drop of water we present, where, though it never can be singled forth, let zeal be pleader for our good intent. Drops not diminish, but increase great floods and mites impair not, but augment our goods. Philander and Orestes, what conceit troubles your silent minds? Let me entreat. Since we are come thus far as we do walk, you would devise some pretty pleasant talk. The air is cool, the evening high and fair. Why should your cloudy looks then show despair? Believe me, fair Eurymene, my skill is simple in discourse and utterance ill. Orestes, if you were disposed to try, can better manage such affairs than I. Why then, Orestes, let me crave of you some old, related story to renew. Another time you shall request of me, as good, if not a greater, courtesy. Trust me as now, nor can I show a reason or mirth unto my mind comes out of season. For inward I am troubled in such sort as all unfit I am to make report of anything may breed the least delight. Rather, in tears, I wish the day were night, for neither can myself be merry now nor treat of all that may be liked of you. That's not but your melancholic old disease, Never that never are disposed but when ye please. Nay, mistress, then, since he denies the task myself, will straight accomplish what ye ask. And though the pleasure in my tale be small, yet, yet may it serve to pass the time with all. Thanks, good Philander. When ye please, say on. Better I do a bad discourse than none. Some time there lived a duke not far from hence, mighty in fame and virtue's excellence. Subjects he had as ready to obey as he to rule, beloved every way. But that which most of all he gloried in, hope of his age and comfort of his kin, was the fruition of one only son, a gallant youth inferior unto none for virtue, shape, or excellence of wit, that after him upon his throne might sit. This youth, when once he came to perfect age, the duke would fain have linked in marriage with diverse dames of honourable blood, but still his father's purpose he withstood. How? Was he not of metal apt to love? Yes, apt enough, as will the sequel prove. But so the stream of his affection lay, as he did lean a quite contrary way, disproving still the choice his father made, and oftentimes the matter had delayed. Now giving hope, he would at length consent, and then again, excusing his intent. What made him so repugnant in his deeds? Another love which this disorder breeds. For even at home within his father's court, the saint was shrined whom he did honour most. The lovely dame, the virgin, 
pure and chaste and worthy of a prince to be embraced. Had but her birth, which was obscure, they said, answered her beauty. This their opinion stayed, yet did this willful youth affect her still, and none but she was mistress of his will. Full often did his father him dissuade from liking such a mean and low-born maid. The more his father strove to change his mind, the more the son became with fancy blind. Alas, how sped the silly lovers then? Others might even grieve the rude, uncivilist men, when hereupon to wean his fixed heart from such dishonour to his high desert, the duke had laboured, but in vain did strive. Thus he began his purpose to contrive. Two of his servants of undoubted truth, he bound by virtue of a solemn oath to train the silly damsel out of sight, and there in secret to bereave her quite. Of what? Her life? Yes, madam, of her life, which was the cause of all the former strife. And did they kill her? You shall hear anon. The question first must be decided on. In your opinion, what's your judgment? Say, who were most cruel? Those that did obey, or he that gave commandment for the fact? In each of them, it was a bloody act. Yet they deserve to speak my mind of both. Most pardon, that were bound thereto by oath. It is enough. We do accept your doom to pass unblamed. Whatever have you become? To pass unblamed, whatever become of me? What may the meaning of these speeches be? Your Emily, my trembling tongue doth fail. My conscience irks, my fainting senses quail. My faltering speech stammers at my thought and parades the guilty message we have brought. By me, what horror doth invade my breast? Me then, Philander, I will tell the rest. <laughs> Damsel, thus fares thy case. Demand not why. You must forthwith prepare yourself to die. Therefore, dispatch and set your mind at rest. Philander, is it true or doth he jest? There is no remedy, but you must die. <coughs> By you I framed my tragic history. The Duke, my master, is the man I meant. His son, the prince, the maid of mean descent, yourself on whom Ascanio so doth dote, as for no reason may remove his thought. Your death the Duke determines by us two To end the love betwixt his son and you oh, and For that cause we trained you to this wood Where you must sacrifice your dearest blood Respect my tears We must regard our own My tender years They are but trifles both My innocence That would our promise break Dispatch forthwith, we may not hear you speak. If neither tears nor innocency move, yet think there's a heavenly power above. Oh, done! <laughs> Stand up preaching here all day. Nay, then since there is no remedy, I pray yet good, my master, to but stay so long till I have taken my farewell with a song of him whom I shall never see again. <laughs> We will afford that respite to your pain. But lest the fear of death appall my mind, sweet gentleman, let me this favour find that you avail mine eyesight with this scarf, that when the fatal stroke is aimed at me, I may not start, but suffer patiently. Agreed. Give me, I'll shadow ye from fear, if this may do it. Oh, I would it might, but shadows want the power to do that right. Ye sacred fires and powers above, forge of desires and working love, cast down your eye, cast down your eye. Yeah. 
sacrifice is lover's blood and from my eyes salt is a flood all which i spend all which i spend for the ascani of my dear friend but in this hour I must feel the bitter power of pricking steel. Yet ill or well, yet ill or well, to the Ascanio still farewell. What means, Philander? I'll oh, forbear thy stroke. Her piteous moan and gesture might provoke hard flints to roof. Hast thou forgot thy oath? Forgot it, no. Then wherefore dost thou interrupt me so? A sudden terror overcomes my thought. Then suffer me that stands in fear of thee. Oh, no, hold, Orestes, hear my reason first. Is all religion of thy vow forgot? Do as thou wilt, but I forget it not. Orestes, if thou standst upon thine oath, let me alone to answer for us both. What answer canst thou give? I will not stay. Hey, villain, then my sword shall make my way. Wilt thou in this against thy conscience strive? I will defend a woman while I live, a virgin and an innocent beside, therefore put up, or else thy chance abide. I'll never sheathe my sword, unless thou show our oath reserved, how we may let her go. That will I do, if truth may be a force. And then will I be pleased to grant remorse. Little thought I, when out of door I went, that thus my life should stand on argument. A lawful oath, in an unlawful cause, is first dispensed with all by reason's laws. Then next respect must to the end be had, because the intent doth make it good or bad. Now here the intent is murder, as thou seest, which to perform thou on thy oath reliest. But since the cause is wicked and unjust, the effect must likewise be held odious. We swore to kill, and God forbids to kill. Shall we be ruled by him or by man's will? Beside, it is a woman is condemned, and what is he that is a man indeed that can endure to see a woman bleed? Thou hast prevailed. Eurymini, stand up. I will not touch thee for a world of gold. Why? Now thou seemst to be of humane mould. But on our grand fair maid that you shall live, will you to us your faithful promise give henceforth to abandon this your country quite, and never more return into the sight of fierce Telemachus, the angry duke, where my, whereby we may be void of all rebuke? Here do I plight my taste and spotted hand, I will abjure this most accursed land, and vow henceforth what fortune e'er betide within these woods and deserts to abide. Now wants there nothing but a fit excuse to soothe the duke in his conceived abuse, that he may be persuaded she is slain, and we our wonted favour still maintain. It shall be thus, within a lawn hard by, obscure with bushes, where no human eye can any way discover our deceit. There feeds a herd of goats and country neat. Some kid or other youngling we will take and with our swords dispatch it for her sake. And having slain it, rip his panting breast and take the heart of the unguilty beast, which to the intent our counterfeit report may seem more likely. 
We will bear to court, and there protest with bloody weapons drawn, it was her heart. And likewise take this lawn, which well Telemachus did know she wore, and let it be all spotted too with gore. But how say you, mistress, will you spare that veil? That or what else to verify your tale. And thanks, Philander and Orestes both, that you preserve me from a tyrant's wrath. I would it were within my power, I wish, to do you greater courtesy than this. But what we cannot by our deeds express in heart, we wish to ease your heaviness. A double debt, yet one word ego. Commend me to my dear Escanio, whose loyal love and presence to forego doth gall me more than all my other woe. Our lives shall never want to do him good, nor yet our death if he in danger stood. And so, mistress, may good fortune be your guide, and aught that may be fortunate beside. The like I wish unto yourselves again, and many happy days devoid of pain. And now, Eurymini, record thy state, so much dejected and oppressed by fate. What hope remains? Wherein hast thou to draw, wherein to triumph, but thine own annoy? If ever wretch might tell a misery, then I, poor I, am only she, unknown of parents, destitute of friends, hopeful of naught, but what misfortune sends, banished to live a fugitive alone, in uncouth paths and regions never known. Behold, Ascanio, but thy only sake, these tedious travels I must undertake. Nor do I grudge, the pain seems less to me, in that I suffer this distress for thee. Well met, fair nymph. Or goddess, if you be. It is strange, methinks, that one of your degree should walk these solitary groves alone. It were no more if you knew my moan. But what are you that questioned me so far? My habit tells you that a forester, that having lost a herd of skittish deer, was of good hope I should have found him here. Trust me, I saw not any, so farewell. Nay, stay, and further of your fortunes tell. I am not one that means you any harm. I think my boy be fled away by charm. <laughs> Ranger, well met. Within thy walk, I pray, sawst thou not Mopso, my unhappy boy? Shepherd, not I. What means to seek him here? Because the wag, possessed with doubtful fear, lest I would beat him for a fault he did. Amongst those trees I do suspect he is hid. <laughs> but how now, Ranger? You mistake, I trow. This is a lady, and no barren doe. It is indeed. And as it seems distressed, whose grief to know I humbly made request, but she as yet will not reveal the same. Perhaps to me she will. <laughs> Speak, gentle dame. What danger great hath driven ye to this place? Make known your state, and look what slender grace a shepherd's poor ability may yield. You shall be sure of, ere I leave the field. Alas, good sir. The cause may not be known, that hath been forced me to be here alone. Nay, fear not to discover what you are. It may be we may remedy your care. Mm. Since need you will, that I renew my grief. Whether it be my chance to find relief or not, I reek not such my crosses are, as sooner I expect to meet despair. Then thus it is, not far from hence do dwell, my parents of the world esteemed well, who with their bitter threats, my grant had won this day to marry with a neighbour's son, and such one to whom I should be wife, as I can never fancy in my life. And therefore, to avoid this endless thrall, this morn 
I came away and left the wall. Now, trust me, virgin. They were much unkind to seek to match you so against your mind. Twas beside unnatural constraint. But by the tenure of your just complaint, it seems you are not minded to return, nor any more to dwell where you were born. It is my purpose, if I might obtain a place of refuge where I might remain. Why, go with me. <laughs> my lodge is not far off, where you shall have such hospitality as shall be for your health and safety. Soft ranger, for you do rage beyond your skill. <laughs> My house is nearer, and for my goodwill it shall exceed a woodman's wooden stuff. Then go with me, and I'll keep you safe enough. <clears throat> I'll bring her to a bower beset with green, and I, an arbour, may delight a queen. Her diet shall be venison at my board. Young kid and lamb we shepherds can afford. Nothing else? Yes, ranging now and then, a hawk. A goose, a capon, or a hen. <laughs> These walks are mine amongst the shady trees. For that, I have a garden full of bees, whose buzzing music with the flowers sweet, each even and morning shall our senses greet. The nightingale is my continual clock. And mine, the watchful, sin-remembering cock. A hunt's up. I can tune her with my hounds. And I can show her meads and fruitful grounds. Within these woods are many pleasant springs. Betwixt yon dales, the echo daily sings. 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 <laughs> I marvel that a rustic shepherd dare with woodman them audaciously compare. Why, hunting is a pleasure for a king, and guards themselves some time for quite the thing. Diana. With her bow and arrows keen, did often use the chase in forests green. And so, alas, the good Athenian knight and swift Actaeon herein took delight. And Atalanta, the Arcadian dame, conceived such wondrous pleasure in the game that with her train of nymphs attending on, she came to hunt the boar of Calidon. <laughs> So did Apollo walk with shepherd's crook, and many kings their sceptres have forsook, to lead the quiet life we shepherds know, <laughs> accounting it a refuge for their woe. But we take choice of many a pleasant walk, and mark the deer, how they begin to stalk, when each, according to his age and kind, pricks up his head, and bears a princely mind, the lusty stag, Conductor of the train bears all the herd in order down the plain. The baser rascals scatter here and there, as not presuming to approach so near. So shepherds sometimes sit upon a hill, or in the cooling shadow of a mill. And as we sit, unto our pipes we sing, and therewith make the neighbouring groves to ring. And as the sun steals downward to the west, we leave our chat and whistle in the fist, which is a signal to our straggling flock as trumpets sound to men in martial shock. Shall I be thus outfaced by a swain? I'll have a guard to wait upon our train of gallant woodmen clad in comely green. The like whereof hath seldom yet been seen. And I, of shepherds, such a lusty crew as never forester the like yet knew, who, for their persons and their neat array, shall be as fresh as is the month of May. Where are you there, you merry-noted swains? You're near a while, and whilst upon the plains your flocks do gently feed. Oh, let's see your skill, how you with chanting can sad sorrow kill. Come, all my jolly boys, and we'll together go, together with our masters to share the lambs and yoes. All in the month of June, of all times in the year, it always comes in season, the lambs and yoes to share. And then we will work hard, my boys, until our backs do break. Our master, he will bring us beer whenever we do lack. Thinks Gemulo to bear the bellowy by singing of a simple roundelay? No. 
I have fellows whose melodious throats shall even as far out past those homely notes as doth the nightingale in music pass, the most melodious bird that ever was. Then for an instant, <coughs> here they are at hand. When they are done, let our desserts be scanned. Sportsmen, arouse, the morning is clear. The larks are singing all in the air. Sportsmen, arouse, the morning is clear. The larks are singing all in the air. Go and tell your sweet lover, the hounds are out. Go and tell your sweet lover, the hounds are out. Saddle your horses, your saddles prepare. With a way to some cover to seek for a hare. Thanks to you both, you both deserve so well, as I want skill your worthiness to tell. And both I do commend for thy goodwill, and both I will honour, love, and reverence still. For never virgin had such kindness shown of strangers, yea, and men to her unknown. But more to end the sudden controversy, since I am made umpire in the plea, this is my verdict. I'll entreat of you a cottage for my dwelling, and of you a flock to tend. And so, indifferent, my grateful pain on either shall be spent. I am agreed, and for the love I bear, I'll boast I have a tenant is so fair. And I will hold it as a rich possession, that she vouchsafes to be of my profession. Then for a sign that no man here hath wrong, from hence let's all conduct her avec un chanson. <laughs> It's a jolly good song, jolly well sung, jolly good company, every one. And if you can beat it, you're welcome to try, but always remember the singer is dry. Give the old bounder some beer, he's had some, he's had some. Well, give the old bounder some more. Half of my burden, one burden, I'm certain. Oh, half of my burden, one burden. I'm sure. Jolly good song, jolly well sung, jolly good company, everyone. And if you can beat it, you're welcome to try. But always remember the singer is dry. Give the old man some beer. He's had some, he's had some. Well, Jock Hino! Jock Hino! Away, Jock Hino! Here, sir, at hand. Jock, you know, where is she? I know not. When went she? I know not. Which way went she? I know not. When shall I seek her? I know not. When shall I find her? I know not. Vengeance take thee, slave. What dost thou know? Marry, sir, that I do know. What villain? And you be so testy. Go look. What are coils here with you? If we knew where she were, what need we seek her? Hmm? <laughs> I think you are lunatic. Where were you when you should have looked after her? Now you go crying up and down after your wench, like a boy had lost his hornbook. Ah, oh, my sweet boy. Ah, oh, my sweet master. <coughs> Nay, I can give you as good words as you can give me. All's one for that. What? Canst thou give me no relief? Faith, sir. There comes not one morsel of comfort from my lips to sustain that hungry maw of your misery. There is such a dearth at this time. God amend it. Oh, Joculo. My breast is full of grief, and yet my hope that only wants relief. For your breast and my belly are in two contrary keys. You walk to get stomach to your meat, and I walk to get meat to my stomach. Your breast full, and my belly's empty. If they chance to part in this case, God send them merry meeting. Then my belly be full, and your breast empty. Ah, oh, Joculo, for the love that ever thou didst stow to thy dear master, poor Ascanio. Rack thy proved wits into the highest strain to bring me back Eurymini again. Nay, master, if wit could do it, I could tell you more. But if it ever be done, the very legerity of the feet must do it. These ten nimble bones must do the deed. I'll trot. Come on, Betty Shun. There's not a bush so big as my beard, but I'll be peeping in it. There's not a cot, but I'll search every corner. If she be above or beneath, over the ground or under, I'll find her out. Stay jocular. Alas, it cannot be. If we should part, I'll lose both her and thee. 
The woods are wide, and wandering thus about, thou mayest be lost, and not my love found out. I pray you, let me go. I pray thee stay. If faith, I'll rather us not know which way. Oh, anyway, all's one. I'll draw a dry foot. If you send not to seek her, you may lie here long enough before she come to seek you. She little thinks we are hunting for her in these quarters. Ah, oh, Joculo, before I leave my boy, of this world's comfort now my only joy, seest thou this place upon this grassy bed with summer's gaudy diaper bespread? <coughs> Under these shadows shall my dwelling be till thou return, sweet Joculo, to me. And if my convoy be not cut off by the way, it shall not be long before I be with you. Well, I pray you look to my master, for here I leave him amongst you. And if I chance to light on the wedge, you shall hear of me by the next wind. In vain, I fear, I beat my brains about, proving by search to find my mistress out. Eurymini! Eurymini! Eurymini, return, and with thy presence yield the beauteous morn. And yet, I fear to call upon thy name. The prattling echo should she learn the same. The last word's accent shall no more prolong, but bear that sound upon her airy tongue, adorned with the presence of my love. The woods, I fear. Such secret powers shall prove, as so shut up each path. Hide every way, because they'd have her go astray, and in that place we'd always have her seen, only because they would be evergreen, and keep the winged choristers still there, to banish winter clean out of the year. <coughs> but why persist I to bemoan my state, when she is gone? In my complaint too late. <sighs> A drowsy dullness closeth up my sight. O powerful sleep, I yield unto thy might. Come hither, Iris. Iris is at hand to attend Joe's wife, great Juno's high command. Iris, I know I do thy service prove, and ever since I was the wife of Jove, thou hast been ready when I call it still, and always most obedient to thy will. Thou seest how that imperial queen of love, with all the gods, how she prevails above, and still against great Juno's hests doth stand to have all stoop and bow at her command. Her doves and swans and sparrows must be graced, and on love's altars must be highly placed. My starry peacocks, which doth bear my state, scarcely allowed within his palace gates. And since herself she thus preferred doth see, now the proud hussies, will contend with me, and practiseth her wanton pranks to play with this Ascanio and Eurymene. But love shall know, in spite of all his skill, Juno's a woman, and will have her will. What is my goddess will? May Iris ask? Iris, on thee I do impose this task. To cross proud Venus and her purblind lad, until her mother and her brat be mad, and with each other set them so at odds till to their teeth they curse and ban the gods. Goddess, the grant consists alone in you. Then mark the course which now you must pursue. Within this her grown forest, there is found a dusky cave thrust low into the ground. So ugly dark, so dampy and so steep as 
for his life the sun durst never peep into the entrance which doth so affright the very day that half the world is night. Where Fenish folks and vapours do abound, there Morpheus doth dwell within the ground. No crowing cock, nor waking bell doth call, nor watchful dog disturbeth sleep at all. No sound is heard in compass of the hill, but everything is quiet, whist, and still, amid this cave, upon the ground, doth lie a hollow plancher, all of ebony, covered with black, whereon the drowsy god, drowned in sleep, continually doth nod. Go, Iris, go and my commandment take, and beat against the doors till sleep awake. Bid him from me in vision to appear unto Ascanio that lieth slumbering here, and in that vision to reveal the way how he may find the fair Eurymene. Madam, my service is at your command. Dispatch it then, good Iris, out of hand. My peacocks and my chariots shall remain about the shore till thou return again. About the business now that I am sent, to sleep's black cave I will incontinent, and his dark cabin boldly will I shake until the drowsy, lumpish god awake. And such a bouncing at his cave I'll keep, that if pale death seized upon the eyes of sleep, I'll rouse him up, that if he shall me hear, I'll make his locks stand up on end with fear. Be silent, air, whilst Iris in her pride, swifter than fought upon the winds of ride. And come presently away, or I will beat upon this door that after this thou sleeps no more. I'll take a nap and come anon. Out, you beast, you block, you stone. Come, or at thy door I'll thunder till both heaven and hell do wander. Sunless, I say. A vengeance split thy chaps asunder. What sunless? Iris! Oh. Oh. I thought it should be thee. Oh. How now, mad wench? What wouldst with me? From mighty Juno, Jove's immortal wife, Somnus, I have come to charge thee on thy life that thou unto this gentleman appear, and in this place... Oh. Thus, as he lieth here, present his mistress to his inward eyes in as true manner as thou canst devise. I would thou wert hanged for waking me. Three sons I have, the eldest Morpheus height. He shows of man the shape or sight. The second, Eichelor, whose behests doth take the forms of birds or beasts. Phantasor. For the third, things lifeless he, 
Choose which like thee of these three. Morpheus! If he in human shape appear. Morpheus! Come forth in perfect likeness here. Oh! oh how call ye the gentlewoman? Eurymene. Of Eurymene. And show this gentleman what of his mistress is become. My dear Ascanio, in this vision, see Eurymene doth thus appear to thee. As soon as sleep hath left thy drowsy eyes, follow the path that on thy right hand lies. <coughs> An aged harvest thou by chance shalt find, that there hath been time almost out of mind, this holy man, this aged reverent father, there in the woods doth root and simples gather. His wrinkled brow tells strengths past long ago, his beard as white as winter's driven snow. He shall discourse the troubles I have passed and brings us both together at the last. Thus, she presents her shadow to thy sight, that would a person gladly, if she might. See how he catches to embrace the shade. This vision fully doth his powers invade, and when the heat shall but a little slake, thou then shalt see him presently awake. Ah, hast thou aught else that I may stand instead? No, Somnus, no. <sighs> Go back unto thy bed. Juno, she shall reward thee for thy pain. Then good night, Iris. I'll to rest again. Morpheus, farewell. To Juno I will fly. And I to sleep. <sighs> as fast as I can hide. Oh, Eurymene! Oh, my good angel, stay! No, vanish not so suddenly away! Oh, stay, my goddess! Whither dost thou fly? Return, sweet Eurymene, tis I! Where art thou? Speak, let me behold thy face. Did I not see thee in this very place even now? Here did I not see thee stand, and here thy feet did bless the happy land. Eurymene, oh, wilt thou not attend? Fly from thy foe, Ascanio is thy friend. The fearful hare, so shuns the labouring hound, and so the deer restues the huntsman's wound. The trembling fowl, so flies the falcon's gripe, the bondman, so his angry master strike. I follow not as Phoebus Daphne did, nor as the dog pursues the trembling kid. Thy shape it was, alas, I saw not thee. That sight were fitter for the gods than me. But if in dreams there any truth be found, thou art within the compass of this ground. Thou range the woods and all the groves about, and never rest until I find thee out. Encumbered. I am disposed to be melancholy, and cannot be private for one villain or other. <laughs> How the devil stumbled this case of rope ripes into my way? Sirrah, what art thou? I am page to a courtier. Ooh, and I a boy to a shepherd. Thou art the apple squire to a new. 
and thou, sworn brother, to a bail of false dice. What art thou? I am a boy to a ranger. <laughs> An outlaw by authority, one that never sets mark of his own goods, nor never knows how he comes by other men's. <laughs> that never knows his cattle, but by their horns. Sirrah, so you might have said of your master's sheep. I marry. This sets fire like touch powder and goes off with a huff. They come off crick cracks and shake their tails like a squid. Ha! <laughs> you rogues! The very steel of my wits shall strike fire from the flint of your understandings. Have you not heard of me? Yes, if you be that jocular that I take you for. We have heard of your exploits for cousining of some seven and thirty <laughs> alewives in the villages hereabouts. A wit as nimble as a sempster's needle, or a girl's finger at her bus coin. <laughs> your jest goes too low, sir. Oh, but tis a tickling jest. Who would have thought to have found this in a plain villain that never wore better garment than a green jerkin? <laughs> oh, sir, though you courtiers have all the honour, you have not all the wit. Soft, sir, tis not... Your wit can carry it away in this company. <laughs> Sweet rogues, your company to me is like music to a wench at midnight when she lies alone and could wish. <laughs> <laughs> yea, marry could she. And thou art as welcome to me as a new poking stick to a chambermaid. <laughs> <laughs> but soft, who comes here? Now the green blade riseth from the buried that in the dark earth many days hath lain. <laughs> Love lives again, that with the dead can be. Love is calm again, like we that spring every What man meant to these? Or they be the fairies that haunt these woods? Oh. We should be pinched most cruelly. Will you have any music? <coughs> music, sir. Will you have any fine, fine music? music? Most <laughs> dainty music. Dainty music. We must set a face in it now. There is no flying. No, sir. I thank you. We are very merry. But <laughs> <laughs> you shall. But you shall. Sir. No, I pray you. Save your head, but it shall not cost you a penny. A penny? Where be your fiddles? You shall have this instruments. Instruments. Oh, I pray you. What must I call you? My name is Penny. Penny. I'm sorry, I cannot purse you. No. I pray you, sir. What must I call you? My name is Cricket. Cricket. I would have wear a chimney for your sake. <laughs> I pray you, you uh, pretty little fellow. What's your name? My name is Little. Little prick. Click. <laughs> little, little prick. Oh, you are a dangerous fairy and fright all the little wenches in the country out of their beds. Oh, I cannot. Who's had no over So I'm out of doors. The peacock is a stunning bird. His song is iridescent, and we tap into other worlds. While in the peacock's presence,
no, great Phoebus. This your silence tends to hide your grief from knowledge of your friends, who, if they knew the cause in each respect, would show their utmost skill to cure the effect. Good ladies, your conceits in judgment are. Because you see me dumpish, you refer the reason to some secret grief of mine. But you have seen me melancholy many a time. Perhaps it is the glowing weather now that makes me seem so ill at ease to you. Fine shifts the colour that you cannot hide. No, no Phoebus. By your looks may be described. Some hid conceit that harbours in your thoughts. Which hath therein some strange impression wrought. That by the course thereof you seem to me another man that you were wont to be. Good ladies, you deceive yourselves in me. What likelihood or token do ye see that may persuade it true that you suppose? Apollo, hence a great suspicion grow. Ye are not so pleasant now as erst in company. Ye walk alone and wander solitary. The pleasant toys we did frequent some time are worn away and now grown out of prime. Your instrument have lost his silver sound that rang of late through all this grovy ground. Your bow, wherewith with the chase you did frequent, is closed in case and long hath been unbent. How differ you from that Apollo now that will home satin shade of laurel bough and with the warbling of your ivory lute to allure the fairies for to dance about. Or from the Apollo that with bended bow did many a sharp and wounding shaft bestow amongst the dragon python scaly wings and forced his dying blood to spout in springs. Believe us, Phoebus, who saw you then and now would think there were a wondrous change in you. Alas, fair dames, to make my sorrows plain would but revive an ancient wound again which gracing presently upon my mind doth leave a scar of former woes behind. Phoebus, if you account us for the same, that tender thee and love Apollo's name, pour forth to us the fountain of your woe, from whence the spring of these your sorrows flow. If we may any way redress your own, command our best, Harm will we do you not? Good ladies, though I hope for no relief, I'll show the grounds to this my present grief. This time of year, or thereabout it was, a cursed be the time, ten times alas, when I from Delphos took my journey down to see the games in noble Sparta town. There saw I that, wherein I gan to joy, a Milcar's son, a gallant, comely boy, height hyacinth, full fifteen years of age, whom I intended to have made my page, and bear a great affection to the boy, as ever Jove in Ganymede did joy. Among the games myself put in a pledge to try my strength in throwing of the sledge, which, poising with my strained arm, I threw so far that it beyond the other flew. My hyacinth, delighting in the game, desired to prove his manhood in the same. And catching ere the sledge lay still on ground, with violent force aloft it did rebound against his head and battered out his brain. And so, alas, my lovely boy was slain. Hard hap, O Phoebus. But sith it's past and gone, we wish you to forbear this frustrate moan. Good ladies, I know my sorrows are in vain, and yet from mourning can I not refrain. Urania, some pleasant song shall sing, to put you from your dumps. Alas, no song will bring the least relief to my perplexed mind. No, Phoebus, what other pastimes shall we find to make ye merry with? Fair dames, I thank you all. No sport nor pastime can release my thrall. My griefs, of course, when it the course hath had, I shall be merry and no longer sad. What will ye then we do? Now please ye, you may go and leave me here to feed upon my woe. Then, then Phoebus, we can but wish ye well again. I thank ye, gentle ladies, 
feel pains. Phoebus, wretched thou thus art. Thou fain with forged excuses to conceal thy pain. O Hyacinth, I suffer not these fits for thee, my boy. No, no, another sits deeper than thou in closet of my breast, whose sight so late hath wrought me this unrest. And yet no goddess, nor of heavenly kind she is, whose beauty thus torments my mind. No fairy nymph that haunts these pleasant woods, no goddess of the flowers, the fields, nor floods, yet such a one whom justly I may call a nymph, as well as any of them all. Eurymene! Eurymene, what heaven affords thee here? So may I say, because thou comes so near, and nearer far unto a heavenly shape, than she of whom Jove triumphed in the rape. I'll sit me down and wake my grief again. To sing a while in honor of thy name. This old world is falling down around my ears. I'm drowning in the fountain of your tears. When all my will is gone, you hold me sway. Live in court or desert woods to range, yet in extremes, wherein we cannot choose, an extreme refuge is not to refuse. Good gentlemen, did any see my heart? I shall not find them out. I am afeard, and my master waiteth with his bow within a standing for to strike a doe. You saw them not? Your silence makes me doubt. I must go farther till I find them out. What seek you, pretty maid? Forsooth, my herd of deer. I saw them lately, but they are not here. I pray so where? An hour ago, or twain. I saw them feeding all above the plain. So much the more I twill to fetch them in. I thank you, sir. Nay, stay, sweet nymph, with me. My business cannot so dispatched be. But pray ye, maid. It will be very good to take the shade in this unhaunted wood. This flowering bay with branches large and great will shroud ye safely from the parching heat. Good sir, my business calls me hence. In haste, I'll oh, stay with him whom conquered thou hast, with him whose restless thoughts do beat on thee, with him that joys thy wished face to see, with him whose joys surmount all joys above, if thou wouldst prove him worthy of thy love. Why, sir, would you desire another make, and why that garland for your mistress' sake? No, nymph, although I love this laurel tree, 
my fancy ten times more affecteth thee. And as the bay is always fresh and green, so shall my love as fresh to thee be seen. Now truly, sir, he offered me great wrong to hold me from my business here so long. Oh, stay, sweet nymph. You really mean? With more advisement view, what one he is that for thy grace doth sue. I am not one that haunts on hills or rocks. I am no shepherd waiting on my flocks. I am no boisterous satyr, no, nor fawn, but am with pleasure of thy beauty drawn. Thou dost not know, God what thou dost not know, the white whose presence thou disdainest so. But I may know, if you'd please to tell. My father in the highest heavens doth dwell, and I am known the son of Jove to be, whereon the folk of Delphos honour me. By me is known what is, what was, and what shall be. By me are learned the rules of harmony. By me the depth of physics laws is found, and power of herbs that grow upon the ground. And thus by circumstances mayest thou see that I am Phoebus, who doth fancy thee. No, sir, by these discourses may I see. You mock me with a forged pedigree. If son you be to Jove, as asked ye said, in making love unto a mortal maid, you work dishonour to your deity. Mm -hmm. I must be gone. I thank ye you for your courtesy. Alas, abandon not thy lover so. I pray so heartily, give me leave to go. The way overgrown with shrubs and bushes thick, the sharpened thorns your tender feet will prick, the brambles round about your train will lap, the burrs and briars about your skirts will wrap. If Phoebus, thou of Jove, the offspring be, dishonour not thy deity so much, with proffered force a silly maid to touch, for doing so, although a god thou be, the earth and men on earth shall wring thy infamy. Hard speech to him that loveth thee so well. <laughs> what know I that? I know it, and can tell, and feel it too. If that your love be such as you pretend, so fervent and so much, for proof thereof, grant me but one request. I will. By Jove, my father, I protest, provided first that thy petition be. Not hurtful to thyself, nor harm to me. For so sometimes did Phaeton, my son, request a thing, whereby he was undone. He lost his life through craving it, and I through granting it lost him, my son, thereby. Then, Phoebus, thus it is. If thou be he that art pretended in thy pedigree, if son thou be to Jove, as thou dost feign, and challengest that title not in vain, now here, brace some sign of God's head then, and change me straight from shape of maid to man. You really? Alas, what fond desire doth move thy mind to wish thee altered from thy native kind? If thou in this thy woman's form canst move not men but gods to sue and seek thy love, content thyself with nature's bounty then, <coughs> and cover not thyself to bear the shape of man. And this, moreover, will I say to thee, fairer man than maid thou shalt never be. These vain excuses manifestly show, whether you usurp Apollo's name or no. As sith my demand so far surmounts your art, ye draw its exceptions on the other part. Nay, then, my doubtless deity to prove, although thereby I forever lose my love. I grant thy wish. Thou art become a man. <laughs> I speak no more than well perform I can. And though thou walk in changed body now, this penance shall be added to thy vow. Thyself a man shalt love a man in vain, and loving wish to be a maid again. Apollo, whether I love a man or not, I thank you. Now I will accept my lot, and since my chains had disappointed you, ye are at liberty to love anew. If ever I love, sith now I am forsaken, when next I love it shall be better taken. <laughs> but whatsoever my fate in loving be, yet thou mayst vaunt that Phoebus 
Lavete. Urimini. 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 Hast thou found my master? Not so well met. Hast thou found thy mistress? Not I by pan. Nor I by pot. Pot? What god's that? The next god to a pan. And such a pot it may be as he shall have more servants than all the pans in a tinker's shop. Frisco, where hast thou been frisking? <laughs> hast thou found? I have found. What hast thou found, Frisco? A couple of crack rooms. And I? And I. I mean you too. Ah, you too. And I, you too. Come, a treble conjunction, all three, all three. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but Frisco has not found the fair shepherdess, thy master's mistress. Not I, by God. Priapus, I mean. Priapus, quoth he. What in a god might that be? A plain god, with a good peg, to hang a shepherdess's bottle upon. Thou, being a forester's boy, should swear by the god of the woods. My master swears by Sylvanus. <laughs> I must swear by his poor neighbour. And here's a shepherd swain swears by a kitchen god, Pan. <laughs> Pan is the shepherd's god. But thou swearest by pot. Yes. What god's that? Well, the god of good fellowship. Well. You have wicked masters that teach such little boys as you are to swear so young. Alas, good old great man, will not your master swear? I never heard him swear six sound oats in all my life. <laughs> May have be cannot, because he's diseased. <laughs> Peace, Mopso, I'll stand to it. He's neither brave courtier, bouncing cavalier, nor boon companion if he swear not sometime. For they will swear, forswear, and swear. How? Swear, forswear, and swear? How is that? They'll swear at dice. Forswear their debts and swear when they lose their labour and love. <laughs> <laughs> well, your masters have much to answer for that bring ye up so wickedly. Nay, my master is damned, I'll be sworn, for his very soul burns in the fiery eye of his fair mistress. My master is not damned, but he is dead, for he hath buried the joys in the bosom of his fair mistress. Well, my master is neither damned nor dead, and yet is in the case of both your masters, like. A wooden shepherd and a sheepish woodman, for he is spent in searching for a lost sheep and spent in hunting a doe that he would fain strike. Faith, and I have foundered with flinging to and fro with chestnuts, hazelnuts, bullets, and wildings for presents from my master to the fair shepherdess. And I am tired like a calf with carrying a kid every week to the cottage of my master's sweet lambkin. I am not tired. But so weary, I cannot go with following a master that follows his mistress, that follows her shadow, that follows the sun, that follows the course. That follow the cult, that follow the mare, the man rode on to Middleton. Hey. <laughs> Shall I speak a wise word? Do, and we will burn our caps. Are not we fools? Is that a wise word? <laughs> Give me leave. Are not we fools to wear our young feet to old stumps when there dwells a cunning man in a cave hereby who, for a bunch of roots, a bag of nuts, or a bushel of crabs, Will tell us where thou shalt find thy master, and which of our masters shall win the wench's favour? Well, bring me to him, Frisco. I'll bring all the points of my hose to bring me right to my master. A bottle of whey shall be his mead, if he save me labour for posting with presents. Here he sits, offended not jocular, oh. for fear he turned me to a jackanapes. Yes, he to an owl, and me to woodcock, a woodcock, an owl, and a knave, a long bill, a broad face, and no tail. Oh, kiss him, Moxham, and be quiet. I'll salute him civilly. Good speed, good man. Welcome, bad boy. He speaks to thee, Joculo. Meaning thee, Frisco. I speak and mean not him, nor him, nor thee. But speaking so, I speak and mean all three. Oh, if ye be good at rhymes and riddles, old man, expound me this. These two serve two, those two serve one. Assoil me this. And I am gone. You three serve three. Those three do seek to one. One shall her find. He comes and she is gone. This is a wise answer. Her going caused his coming, for if she had never gone, he had never come. Good master wizard, leave these murderies and tell Mozzo plainly 
whether Demulo, my master, that gentle shepherd, shall win the love of the fair shepherdess or not. And I'll give ye a bottle on as good way as ever ye they lips do. And good father fortune teller, let Frisco know whether Silvio, my master, that lusty forester, shall gain that same gay shepherdess or no. I promise you nothing for your pain, but a bag full of nuts. If I bring a crab or two in my pocket, take them for advantage. And gentle master wise man, tell Joculo if his noble master Ascanio, that gallant courtier, shall be found by me. And she found by him, for whom he hath lost his father's favour, and his own liberty, and I my labour. Uh, and I'll give ye thanks, <laughs> for we courtiers neither give nor take bribes. I take your meaning better than your speech, and I will grant the thing you do beseech. But, for the tears of lovers be no toys, I'll tell their chants in parables to boys. In what you will, let's hear our master's luck. Thy master's door shall turn unto a buck. Thy master's you be changed to a ram. Thy master seeks a maid and finds a man. Yet for his labour shall he gain his meed. The other two shall sigh to see him speed. Then my master shall not win the shepherdess. No. Haste thee home, and bid him right his wrong. The shepherdess will leave his flock ere long. I will run to all my master of that. My master woodman takes wooden pains to no purpose, I think. What say ye? Shall he speed? No. Tell him so, and bid him tend his dear and cease to woe. He shall not wed this year. I am not sorry for it. Farewell, John Kilo. I may go with thee, for I shall speed even so too by staying behind. Better, my boy, thou shalt thy master find, and he shall find the party he requires, and yet not find the sum of his desires. Keep on that way. Thy master walks before whom when thou findst, Lose him, good boy, no more. Tidings of my love in neither desert, grove, nor shady wood, nor obscure thicket where my foot hath trod. But every ploughman and rude shepherd swain doth still reply unto my greater pain. Some satyr then, or goddess of this place, some water nymph, vouchsafe me so much grace as by some view, some sign or other show. I may have knowledge if she live or no. 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 Oh, then my poor heart is buried to in woe. Record it once more if the truth be so. 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 How? That your is dead or live? Live. 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 Come now, gentle goddess, that redeems my soul from death to life. Oh, tell me quickly, where? 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 In some remote far region or else near? Near. Oh, what conceals her from my thirsty eyes? Is it restraint or some unknown disguise? Disguise. 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 Let me be hanged, my lord, but all is lies. 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 True, we are both persuaded. Thou dost lie. Thou dost lie. Thou dost lie. Who? I? Who? I? Who? I? I? Thou? I? I? Thou? Thou darest not come and say so to my face? Thy face. Thy face. I'll make you then forever pray to me more. Oh. Oh. Ha! Will you pray more? I'll see that presently. Any shock, you know. It is the echo boy that mocks our grief and laughs at our annoy. Hard by this grove there is a goodly place, for six two hills still fresh with drops of rain. Where never spreading oak nor poplar grew might tinder the prospect or other view. But all the country that about it lies presents itself unto our mortal eyes. Save that upon each hill by leafy trees, 
the sun its highest, his scorching heat may lease. There, languishing, myself I will betake, as heaven shall please, and only for her sake. Stay, master, I have spied the fellow now that mocked us all this while. See where he sits. The very shape my vision told me of that I should meet with as I strayed this way. What lines he draws? Let's go not over far. Let me alone, thou doth but trouble me. You'll topple us all or not, ye shall see. Good speed, fair sir. My lord, do ye not mark how the sky thickens and begins the dark? Health to ye, sir. Oh, nay, then, God be our speed. Forgive me, sir. I saw ye not, indeed. Pardon me, rather, for molesting you. Such another face I never knew. Thus studious I am wont to pass the time by true proportion of each line from line. Oh, now I see. He was learning to spell. There's A, B, C, and S, P, E, L. L. <laughs> Tell me, I pray ye, sir, may I be bold to crave the cause of your abode within this cave? To tell you that in this extreme distress were but a tale of fortune's fickleness. Sometime I was a prince of Lesbos' isle and lived beloved whilst my good stars did smile, but clouded once with this world's bitter cross, my joy to grief, my gain converts to loss. Forward, I pray ye, faint not in your tale. It will not all be worth a cup of ale. A short discourse in that which is too long, however pleasing, can never seem but wrong. Yet would my tragic story fit the stage. Pleasant in youth, but wretched in mine age. Blind fortune, setting up and pulling down. Abused by those myself raised to renown. But that which brings me near and wounds my heart is a false brother's base, unthankful part. A small offence compared with my disease. No doubt ingratitude in time may cease and be forgot. My grief outlives all hours, raining on my head, continual hapless showers. You sing of yours and I of mine relate to everyone. Seems worse his own estate. But to proceed, exiled thus by spite, both country I forego and brother's sight. In coming hither where I thought to live, yet here I cannot but lament and grieve. Some comfort yet in this there doth remain, that you have found a partner in your pain. How are your sorrows subject, let me hear? More overthrown and deeper in despair than is the manner of your heavy smart. My cureless grief doth rankle at my heart. And, in a word, to hear the sum of all, I love and am beloved, but there with all the sweetness of that banquet must forego, whose pleasant taste is changed with bitter woe. A conflict but to try your noble mind, as common unto youth as rain to wind. But hence it is that doth me treble wrong. Expected good that is forborne so long doth lose the virtue which the use would prove. Are you then, sir, despised of your love? No, but deprived of her company. And for my careless negligence therein, and bound to do this penance my sin, that if I never find where she remains, I vow a year shall be my end of pains. Was she then lost within this forest here? Lost or forlorn, to me she was right dear. But this is certain, unto him that could the place where she abides to me unfold, forever I vow myself his friend, never revolting till my life did end. And therefore, sir, as well I know your skill, if you would give me physic for this ill, and show me if you and Minnie do live, it were a recompense for all my pain, and I should think my joys were full again. They know the want of health that have been sick. Myself, sometime acquainted with the like, to learn in duty of a kind regard, to pity him whose hap hath been so hard. How long, I pray ye, hath she absent been? Three days it is since that my love was seen. Here's learning for the nonce that stands on points. For all his cunning, I'll scarce give two points. <sighs> 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 mm. 
Mercurio regnante virum. Mercurio regnante ura Subsequente luna foeminum designat. Mercurio regnante virum. Subsequente luna foeminum designat. <gasps> Nay, and you go to Latin. <laughs> then tis sure my master will find her, if he can tell when. I cannot tell what reason it should be, but love and reason here do disagree. By proof of learned principles I find the manner of your loves against all kind, and not to feed ye with uncertain joy, whom you affect so much is but a boy. A riddle for my life, some antic jest. Did I not tell ye what his cunning was? I, I love a boy. My art does tell me so. And not a fresh increase unto my wife. I dare avouch what lately I have said. The love that troubles you is for no maid. As well I might be said to touch the sky, or dark the horizon with tapestry, or walk upon the waters of the sea, is to be haunted with such lunacy. If it be false, mine art I will defy. Amazed with grief, my love is then transformed. Master, be contented. This is leap year. Women wear breeches, petticoats are dear, and that's his meaning. On my life it is. Oh God, and shall my torments ever cease? Repress the fury of your troubled mind. Walk here a while. Your lady you may find. A lady and a boy. For this hangs well together, like snow in harvest, sunshine and foul weather. God had so dearly caught. But who are these alone? I cannot choose but blush for shame that anyone should see you remedy in this disguise to be. It is, it is not, my love, your remedy. Hark! Someone hallows, gentlemen, adieu. <laughs> in this attire, I dare not stay their view. My love, my joy, my life, by eye, by face, by tongue, it should be she. Oh, I, it was my love. I'll after her. And though she pass the eagle in her flight, I'll never rest until I have gained her sight. Love carries him and so retains his mind that he forgets how I am left behind. Yet will I follow, softly as I can, <laughs> in hope to see the fortune of the man. Nay. Let them go in God's name, one by one. With my old heart, I am glad to be alone. Here's old transforming. Would, with all his art, transform this tree into a tart. Oh, ha, ha, ha. See then if I would flinch from hence or no. But, for it is not so, I needs must go. Is it a bargain, Gemulo, or not? Thou never used me, break my word, I wot, nor will I now, betide me bail or bliss. Nor I mine, and here her cottages. I'll call her forth. Will Silvio be so rude? Never betwixt ourselves shall we conclude our controversy, for we overween. Not I, but thou. For though thou jest in green, as fresh as meadow in a morn of May, and scorch the shepherd, for he goes in grey, but forester, believe it as thy creed. My mistress minds my person, not my weed. So does I thought. Because she tends thy sheep, thou thinkst in love of thee she taketh keep. Ugh, that is as townish damsels lend the hand, but send the heart to him aloof to stand. So deals Eurymene with Silvio, all be. She look more blithe on Gemulo. Her heart is in the dial of her eye that points me hers. That shall we quickly try. Eurymene! Eurymene! Stop thy throat! Unto thy hound, thou hallow, is such a note. I thought that shepherds would be mannerless, but woodmen are ruder grooms, I guess. How should I call her? Swain. But by her name. So up in all the ploughman calls his dame. Call her in carol from her quiet comfort. 
Agreed. But whither shall begin is not draw cuts. Content, the longest shall begin. <laughs> Sing loud, for she is far within. Instruct thy singing in thy forest ways. Shepherds know how to chant their roundelays. Repeat our bargain ere we sing our song, lest, after wrangling, should our mistress wrong. If me she choose, thou must be well content. If thee she choose, I give thee like consent. Tis done. Now, Pan, pipe thy sweetest reed. And as I love, so let thy servant speed. As little lambs lift up their snowy side, <laughs> and mounting lark salutes the grey-eyed morn. And from the oaken leaves the honey glides, where nightingales record upon the thorn. So rise my thoughts, so all my senses cheer, when she surveys my flock, and she, my dear, Eurymini, Eurymini, come forth, come forth. Come forth and cheer these plains. Heads for sorrow, tails for joy. Your yes makes a man, your no still a boy. So raise my thoughts, may my senses cheer. When you choose my flaw, when you Fellow, fellow, I defy thee. Fellow, fellow, I defy thee. Fellow, fellow, I defy thee. Oh, the magpie brings us tidings. Of news both fair and foul. She's more cunning than the raven, more wise than any owl. So bring us news of the harvest by the oak and ash and thorn. So we'll know if we'll wake alone when the lark salutes the morn. Heads for sorrow, tails for joy. Your yes makes a man, your no still a boy. So raise my thoughts, may my senses cheer. When you choose my flaw, when you pick my dear. The woodman's love. And lady of the swain. <clears throat> Fair forester and lovely shepherd swain, your carols call Eurymini in vain, for she is gone. Her cottage and her sheep, with me, her brother, had she left to keep, and made me swear by Pan ere she did go to see them safely kept for Gemulo. What? Of my love, a newcome lover then? What? Have my mistress got another man? This swain will rob me of you, Rimini. This youth has power to win your Rimini. This stranger's beauty bears away my pride. This stranger will bewitch her with his eyes. It is Adonis. It is Ganymede. My blood is chill. My heart is cold as lead. Fair youths, you forgot for what she came. You seek your love, she is gone. The more to blame. Not so. My sister had no will to go, but that a parent should command was so. It is thy excuse. Thou art not of her kin, but as my rival comes to my love to win. By great Apollo's sacred deity, that shepherdess so near is sib to me, as I name a for all this world her wed. For she and I in one soft womb were bred. But she is gone, her flock is left to me. The sheep cuts mine, and I will in and see. And I. Go both, cold covert shall you find. My manly shape hath yet a woman's mind, prone to reveal what secret she doth know. God pardon me, 
I was about to show my transformation. Please, they come again. Have ye found her? No, we look in vain. I told ye so. Yet hear me, new come swain. All be thy seemly feature, set no sail but honest truth upon thy novel tale. Yet, for this world is full of subtlety, mm. we wish thee go with us for company. Unto a wise man, woning in this wood, height Aramanth, <laughs> whose wit and skill is good, that he may certify our amazing doubt, how this strange chance and change hath fallen out. I'm content, have with you when you will. Even now? You make you music, you have any thou wouldst allow it. Am I grown so loathsome to thee now? Ascanio, time I fear thy must confess, when in thy presence was my happiness. But now the manner of my misery hath changed that course, that so it cannot be. What wrong have I contrived? What injury to alienate thy liking so from me? If thou be she whom sometime thou didst fade, and bearest not the name of friend in vain. Let not the borrowed guise of altered kind alter the wonted liking of thy mind. And though in the habit of a man thou goest, yet be the same Eurymine thou wast. How gladly would I be thy lady still, if earnest vows my answer to my will. And is thy fancy altered with thy guise? My kind, but not my mind in any wise. What though thy habit differ from thy kind, thou mayst retain thy wonted loving mind. And so I do. Then why art thou so strange? Or wherefore doth thy plighted fancy change? Scadio, my heart doth honour thee. And yet continuest still so strange to me. If not strange, so far as kind will give me leave. Unkind, that kind that kindness doth bereave. Thou sayest thou lovest me. As a friend is friend, and so I vow to love thee to the end. I reck not of such love. Love me, but to spare your women, he loved Ascanio. That love's denied unto my present kind. Kindly shows unkind, I do thee find. I see thou art as constant as the wind. And doth kind allow a man to love a man? Why? Art not thou Eurymini? I am. Eurymini, my love? The very same. And wast not thou a woman then? Most true. And art thou changed from a woman now? Too true. Oh, these tales my mind perplex. <laughs> thou art Eurymini. Nay, but not in sense. What then? A man. In guise thou art, I see. The guise thou seest, not that my kind agree. Before thy flight thou wast a woman, though. True, Escalio. And since art thou a man? Too true, dear friend. Then have I lost a wife? But found a friend, whose dearest blood and life shall be as ready as thine own for thee. In place of wife, such friend thou hast of me. There they are, master, well overtaken. I thought we two should never meet again. You went so fast that I, to follow ye, slipped over hedge and ditch and many a tall tree. Well said, my boy. Thou knowest not how to lie. To lie, sir? How say you? Was it not so? You were at my heels, though far off ye know. For, master, not to counterfeit with you now, he's as good a footman as a shackled sow. <laughs> good sir, you're welcome. Sirrah, hold your prate. What speed in that I told to you of late? Both good and bad, as doth the sequel prove. 
For wretched I have found and have lost my love, if that be lost which I can ne'er enjoy. Faith, mistress, you're to blame to be so coy. The day hath been, but what is that to me? When more familiar with a man you'd be. I told you you should find a man of her, or else my rule did very strangely err. Father, the trial of your skill I find. My love's transformed into another kind, and so I have found and have lost my love. Oh, ye cannot tell. Take her aside and prove. But, sweet Eurymini, make some report on why thou departest from my father's court, and how this strange mishap to thee befell. Let me entreat thou wouldst the process tell. To show how I arrived in this ground, will be renewing of an ancient wound. Another time that office I'll fulfil. Let it suffice. I came against my will, and wandering about this forest side, it was my chance of Phoebus to be spied, whose love, because I chastely did withstand, he thought to off me with a violent hand. But for a present shift to shun his rape, I wished myself transformed to this shape, which he performed, God knows against his will. And I, since then, have wailed my fortune still, not for misliking what I find in me, but for thy sake, whose wife I meant to be. Thus have you heard our woeful destiny, which I in heart lament, and so doth she. The fittest remedy that I can find is this. To ease the torment of your mind, persuade yourselves that great Apollo can as easily make a woman of a man as contrary wise he made a man of her. I think no less. Then humble suit prefer to him. Perhaps your prayers may attain to have her turned into her form again. But Phoebus such a state to me doth bear, as hardly we shall win his grant, I fear. Then, in these verdant fields, all richly dyed with nature's gifts and flora's painted pride, there is a goodly spring whose crystal streams beset with myrtles keep back Phoebus' beams. There, in rich seats all wrought of ivory, the graces sit listening the melody. The warbling birds do from their pretty bills unite in concord as the brook distills whose gentle murmur with his buzzing notes is as a bass unto their hollow throats. Garlands beside they wear upon their brows, made of all sorts of flowers earth allows, from whence such fragrant sweet perfume arise, as you would swear that place is paradise. To them let us repair with humble heart, and meekly show the manner of your smart. So gracious are they in Apollo's eyes, as their entreaty quickly may suffice in your behalf. I'll tell them of your states, and crave their aids to stand your advocates. Forever you shall bind us to you then. Come, go with me. I'll do the best I can. Is this not hard luck, to wander so long, and in the end find his wife marked wrong? <laughs> A proper jest as ever I heard tell. In sooth, methinks the breach becomes her well. And might it not make their husbands fear them? Would all the wives in our town might wear them? Uh, tell me, you thought a stranger here or no? Is your commission, sir, to examine me so? What, is it thou? Now, by my troth, well met. By your leave. It's well overtaken yet. I little thought I should have found thee here. Perhaps so, sir. I prithee speak. What cheer? Well, what cheer can here be hoped for in these woods? Except... Trees, stones, briars, bushes, or buds. My meaning is, I fain would hear thee say how thou doest, man. Why, thou takes this another way. Why then, sir, I do as well as I may. And to persuade ye that welcome ye be, will please ye, sir, to eat a crab with me. Believe me, Jock, you know, reasonable hard cheer. Philander, tis the best we can get here. But when return ye to the court again? Uh, shortly, now I have found thee. Well, to requite your pain, shall I entreat you bear a present from me? To whom? To the duke. What should it be? But because venison so conveniently doth not fall. Ah, 
a peck of acorns to make merry with all. What means thou by that? By my trot, sir, as ye see, acorns are good enough for such as he. I wish his honour well, and to do him good, would he have eaten all the acorns in the woods. Good words, Jocolo, of your lord and mine, as I agree with such a churlish swine. How does his honour? Indifferently well. I wish him better. How? Vice regent in hell. Dost thou wish so for that he hath done? Aye, for the love he bears unto his son. Ah, <laughs> He's grown of late as fatherly and mild as ever father was unto his child, and sent me forth to search the coast about, if so my hap might be to find him out, and if Eurymene alive remain, to bring them both unto the court again. Where is thy master? Well, walking about the ground. Oh, that his love Eurymene were found. Why, so she is. Come, follow me and see. I'll bring you straight where they remaining be. Cease your contention for Eurymene. Nor words, nor vows can help her misery. But he it is who did her first transform, must calm the gloomy rigour of this storm. Great Phoebus, whose palace we are near, salute him then in his celestial sphere, that with the notes of cheerful harmony, he may be moved to show his deity. But where is Eurymene? Have we lost her sight? Poor soul, within a cave with fear or fright, she sits to shun Apollo's angry view, until she see what of our prayers ensue, if we can reconcile his love or no, or that she must continue in her woe. But once have we tried Ascanio, for thy sake, and once again we will his power awake, not doubting, but as he is of heavenly race, at length he will take pity on her case. Sing, therefore, and each party from his heart, in this our music bear a cheerful part. Fair Phoebus, fair Phoebus, Apollos, Apollos, descend thou from my love. It shall be seen we reverence Phoebus' name. You sacred sisters of fair Helicon, on whom my favours evermore have shone, in this you must have patience with my vow. I cannot grant what you aspire unto, nor was it my fault she was transformed so, but her own fond desire, as ye well know. We told her too, before her vow was passed, that cold repentance would ensue at last. And sith herself did wish the shape of man, she caused the abuse. Digest it how she can. Alas, if unto her you be so hard, yet of Ascanio, have some more regard, and let him not endure such endless wrong that hath pursued her constant love so long. Great God, the grievous travels I have passed in restless search to find her out at last. My plates, my toils, in lieu of my annoy, have well deserved my lady to enjoy. Penance too much have I sustained before. O Phoebus, plague me not with any more. Nor be thou so extreme now at the worst to make my torments greater than at the first. My father's late displeasure is forgot, and there's no let, nor any churlish plot, to interrupt our joys from being complete. 
but thy good favour to entreat. In thy great grace it lies to make my state most happy now, or most unfortunate. Heavenly Apollo, on our knees I pray, vouchsafe thy great displeasure to allay. What honour to thy godhead will arise to plague a silly lady in this wise? Beside, it is a stain unto thy deity to yield thine own desires the sovereignty. Then show some grace unto a woeful dame, and in these groves our tongue shall sound thy fame. Apollo, 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 Arise. Dear nurses of divinest skill. <sighs> divinest skill. <laughs> you sacred muses of Parnassus Hill. Phoebus is conquered by your dear respect, and will no longer clemency neglect. You have not sued nor prayed to me in vain. I grant your wills. She is a maid again. Thy praise shall never die whilst I do live. Nor will we slack perpetual thanks to give. Thalia, in the cave where she remains, the fairies keep, request them of their pains. And in my name bid them forthwith provide from that dark place to be the lady's guide. And in the bounty of their liberal mind, to give her clothes according to her kind. I go, divine Apollo! Haste again. No time too swift to ease a lover's pain. No sacred Phoebus. Endless thanks to thee, that dost vouchsafe so much to pity me. And, aged father, for your kindness shown, imagine not your friendship ill bestowed, that the earth shall sooner vanish and decay, than I will prove unthankful anyway. It is sufficient recompense to me if at my silly help of pleasure ye. If you enjoy your love and heart's desire, it is enough, nor do I more require. Grave Aramanthus, now I see thy face. I call to mind how tedious a long space thou hast frequented these sad deserts here. Thy time employed, in heedful mind I bear the patient sufferance of thy former wrong. The poor estate and sharp exile so long. The honourable port thou borest some time, Till wronged thou wast with undeserved crime, By them whom thou to honour didst advance. The memory of which thy heavy chance Provokes my mind to take remorse on thee. Father, henceforth my client shalt thou be, and pass the remnants of thy fleeting time. With laurel wreath among the muses nine. And when thy age hath given place to fate, thou shalt exchange thy former mortal state, and after death a palm of fame shalt wear, amongst the rest that live in honour here. And lastly know that fair Eurymene, Redeem it now from former misery, thy daughter is. <laughs> whom I for that intent did hide from thee in this thy banishment, that so she might the greater scourge sustain for putting Phoebus to so great a pain. But freely now, enjoy each other's sight. No more Eurymene. Abandon quite that borrowed name, as Atlanta she is called, and here the woman in her right shape installed. Is then my love derived of noble race? No more of that. <laughs> but mutually embrace. Lives my Atlanta, whom the rough seas wave, I thought had brought unto a timeless grave. Look not so strange. It is thy father's voice. <laughs> and this thy love, Atlanta now rejoice. As in another world of greater bliss, my daunted spirits do stand amazed at this. So great, a tide of comfort overflows, as what to say my faltering tongue scarce knows. But only this, unperfect though it be, 
immortal thanks, great Phoebus, unto thee. Well, lady, you are retransformed now. But I am sure you did repent your vow. Bright lamp of glory, pardon my rashness past. The penance was your own, though I did fast. Behold, dear love, to make your joys abound, yonder Philander comes. Oh, sir, well found. But most especially, it glads my mind to see my mistress restored to kind. My lord and madam, to requite your pain, Telemachus hath sent for you again. All former quarrels now are trodden down, and he doth smile. That heretofore did frown. Thanks, kind Philander, for your friendly news. Like Juno's balm, that our life's blood renews. But, lady, first ere you your journey take, vouchsafe at my request one grant to make. Most willingly. The matter is but small, to wear a branch of laurel on your cool. For Phoebus' sake, lest else I be forgot, and think upon me when you see me not. Here, while I live, a solemn oath I make to love the laurel for Apollo's sake. Our suit is dashed. <laughs> you may depart, I see. Nay, Gemulo and Silvio, contented be. This night let me entreat you. You will take such cheer as I and these poor dames can make. Tomorrow morn will bring you on your way. Your godhead shall command us all to stay. Then, ladies, Congratulate this happy chance with some delightful <coughs> tune and pleasant dance. Mean space upon his harp will Phoebus play, so both of them may boast another day. And make report that, when their wedding chanced, Phoebus gave music, and the muses danced. So let's banish all despair, hope and pleasure to embrace. And let's banish all despair, hope and pleasure to embrace. And let's banish all despair, hope and pleasure to embrace. And we'll dance around the forest. Rejoice and sing, and couple friend with friend. Rejoice and sing, and couple friend with friend. Rejoice and sing, and couple friend with friend. And we'll dance around the Rejoice and sing, a couple friend with friend, and we'll dance.